Yeah. Uh, good morning. Um, today uh, we're going to be talking about junior kindergarten. Um, so it, it, right now I'll ask our, my colleagues to introduce themselves with Mr. Blake. Good morning, Frederick Blake, MLA for Mackenzie Delta. Welcome. Uh, good morning, uh, Tom Beaulieu, MLA for Tuned and Willide. Good morning, Danny McNeely, Santu Region. Good morning, Michael Nadley, MLA for Ditchell. Good morning, Julie Green, Yellowknife Center. Kevin O'Reilly, Friend Lake. Lucy Bird, MLA, Tabatcha. Karen um, Testart, MLA for Cam Lake. On my left is Megan Welsh, is our researcher, and the gentleman that's handing out the flat turts is uh, our clerk, Doug Showerty. Uh, my name's Shane Thompson. I'm the chair of the Social Development Committee and representing the Hende region. Uh, at this point in time, can I have somebody approve the agenda as presented? I'll move by Tom. Any questions? All in favor? Okay, passed. Any conflicts of interest? None. <clears throat> so the public hearing on implementation of junior kindergarten with the Honorable Alfred Moses, Minister of Education, <laughs> Culture, and Employment. At this point in time, Minister Moses, would you introduce your uh, witnesses, your staff, and, and then after that, if you have any comments, um, as the process is, is we'll do opening comments and then we'll do the presentation, then people will ask questions afterwards. Okay. Thank we you, uh, Mr. Chair. I am uh, pleased to be here today to discuss the implementation of junior kindergarten that's been undertaken by the Department of Education, Culture and Employment. Uh, to my immediate left is Ms. Sylvia Hayner, our Deputy uh, Minister of the Department. Uh, on my far left is Ms. Rita Mueller, Assistant Deputy Minister of Education and Culture. On my right is Mr. Olin Lovely, the Assistant Deputy Minister of Corporate Services. Uh, also joining us is uh, Julia Mott, Senior Advisor to the Deputy Minister. Uh, Myla Page, uh, my special ministerial, ministerial advisor, and Shelley uh, Capralian, Director of Early Childhood and Learning. Uh, before I begin my opening comments, I just want to appreciate all the work that uh, uh, the members have been doing in terms of working on implementing junior kindergarten. Uh, I know you guys have been uh, bombarded with emails, probably a lot of discussions out in the public. Uh, I've been getting the same thing, uh, both from yourselves as well as members of the public. Uh, we're trying to work on this to provide quality early childhood programming to, to all of our communities uh, throughout the Northwest Territories. And uh, I hope that after today's presentation, things will uh, ease down a little bit and that we can start working on uh, getting these programs out in place. At the beginning of the 18th Legislative Assembly, all members got together to discuss how we wanted to improve the lives of Northerners and what our priorities would be. As our discussions moved forward, one key priority that we identified was supporting quality early childhood development and implementing universal and affordable daycare. It was clear that junior kindergarten would move us a long way to achieving this goal. As we started to roll out junior kindergarten across the north, we realized that there were questions that still needed to be answered, and members asked us to address stakeholder concerns prior to moving forward. Over the past months, ECE staff have traveled across the north to as many communities as possible to engage the stakeholders and hear their concerns. I've also been hearing from northerners, as have many of you, and I've met with several groups on this matter. We have heard that while there is widespread support for the concept of junior kindergarten and all our research shows that children who have been through junior kindergarten are much more ready to learn than those who, are not, who have not. Northerners are concerned about how it's going to be funded. I've heard the same message from the education board chairs and from yourselves as MLAs. Mr. Chair, my cabinet colleagues and I have taken a hard look at the financial resources to us as, as a government during this period of fiscal restraint. As you know, we have many competing priorities across all departments, all of which have merit. I'm pleased to advise you that today, and I'm sure you've heard through the news, that this government will be providing an additional $1.5 million of new money to education boards to implement junior kindergarten. 
I've also directed my department to provide an additional $500,000 from within for further investment. On top of this, Mr. Chair, the government will pay for any school infrastructure changes required because of JK. As well, we will provide additional money to each school introducing JK for play-based resources for the children. This adds up to an annual investment of $2 million plus a one-time investment of $3.8 million. Will this cover the entire cost of junior kindergarten? No. Education boards will still have to fund $3.1 million from internal resources. However, I do believe, as do my colleagues, that with a budget of just over $100 million, $150 million and with the prudent and professional financial management that we know boards are capable of, that finding $3.1 million or about 2% of their total budget is absolutely achievable without impacting student programming. Mr. Chair, I've also heard from the Aboriginal Head Start and the Montessori program who are concerned that JK will adversely affect their attendance. My staff and I have met with these groups several times to provide them with information. We invited the federal government staff to meet with the Aboriginal Head Start staff to allay their fears that federal funding will be impacted, which the federal government have told them will not happen. We have assured Yellowknife parents who strongly believe in the value of the Montessori program that they are free to choose to continue sending their children there. We have said many times that junior kindergarten is optional for parents. But Mr. Chair, there is a reality here in the, for Northern parents. Montessori is only offered in Yellowknife and not all parents can afford to send their children there. Aboriginal Head Start offers some excellent cultural program, programming, but is only available in eight of our 33 communities. Junior kindergarten will be available in all communities and is free to all parents. It is a play-based curriculum. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, but I also just want to emphasize again that it is optional. Uh, it, for, for, for all parents. It is a play-based curriculum that will be delivered either by teachers or by qualified early childhood instructors. <clears throat> and Mr. Chair, employing early childhood instructors is another change we have made after hearing concerns from the education boards that their early childhood staff are more than qualified to deliver the curriculum even though they do not have a formal teaching degree. There is no doubt that JK delivers the right result to our children to ensure that they are better prepared for their future. We have addressed the funding issue, we have listened to the stakeholders' concerns, and we have made investments and improvements because despite our government's fiscal reality, we believe, and I believe, that JK is the right thing to do for our children, our families, and our communities, and it supports the priorities of this 18th Legislative Assembly. Uh, Mr. Chair, with your permission, I will ask uh, my Deputy Minister to provide you with a presentation that offers more details of our plans uh, moving forward, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that members may have. And furthermore, Mr. Chair, uh, we did have a meeting with all the board chairs and superintendents uh, last week. Uh, I'm sure you guys have seen the communique. Uh, there was very good discussions on a number of issues. Junior kindergarten was one that was brought up. And uh, I also believe that uh, members have received some community profiles of uh, early childhood programs in each of your communities that you represent, uh, some that offer Aboriginal Head Start, some that don't have any uh, early childhood programs, and some that are, are doing a really good job uh, offering junior kindergarten for the last, uh, last year, two years, or three years. So uh, all that information, we've been trying to uh, be as open and transparent in getting that out to, to you guys as uh, representatives for your respected communities, and also to uh, let you know what kind of services are out there for early childhood programming. So with that, uh, Mr. Chair, if you don't mind, I'd like uh, my Deputy uh, Minister, Ms. Hayner, to uh, go through the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Moses. Ms. Hayner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I believe you all have the presentation before you. Uh, actually, myself, Rita, and Olin were 
all three going to do sections of the presentation. I will do the first several slides, then I'll turn it over to Rita, uh, and Olin will come in on the financial costing piece, and then I'll wrap things up at the end. Okay, uh, Ms. Hainer? And just so when you make those changes, just direct it to me, and then we will move on to that person. Okay. So just because it's recorded properly. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Hainer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the first slide that you have before you, slide number two, just gives you an overview of what we intend to cover for you today. As you can see, we want to give you some contextual information, um, give you a sense of, of what the benefits are of junior kindergarten, um, and um, end up obviously with information on costs and next steps and where we're going with implementation. Slide three. As the Minister referenced at the beginning of this assembly, uh, members got together and set out their priorities. In response to these priorities, the GNWT put forward a proposed mandate that was ultimately agreed to by the assembly. Within that mandate, the GNWT identified that we will be undertaking the work necessary to implement free play-based care for four-year-olds, otherwise known as junior kindergarten. On the next slide, um, <coughs> Why are we implementing junior kindergarten? You see the problem statement there on, on this page. Um, what that information means is that a child without additional support and care <coughs> may experience future challenges in school and society. The early development instrument has been shown to have tremendous predictive validity. That is, being below the threshold or cutoff in kindergarten has a direct relationship to children's scores in later grades. More precisely, those who are deemed vulnerable in kindergarten tend to do poorer academically in later grades. The EDI has also been shown to be a good predictor of adult health, education, and social outcomes. The number there on that slide, 53% of our children are behind in their growth and development um, as demonstrated by the EDI. That is a most concerning figure and obviously um, was quite prominent in determining some of our steps forward uh, around the implementation of junior kindergarten. I just want to emphasize as well that junior kindergarten is not the only thing that this government is pursuing in order to um, address these poor outcomes for children. We are partnering with the Department of Health and Social Services around the development and implementation of an early childhood development framework. So our goal, the EDI questionnaire asks questions pertaining to five areas or domains of development, physical health and well-being, social competency, emotional maturity, language and cognitive development, and communication and general knowledge. And on the next slide, you will see an actual bar graph that shows some of the results for each of those domains. This slide shows the EDI results across the five domains for those five-year-olds who attended junior kindergarten. That's the green bars, and for those who did not, that's the red bars. This data only includes those students who did not attend any prior licensed-based care. When we compare the vulnerability rates between those who attended junior kindergarten and did not in 2016, we see that those who attended junior kindergarten have lower vulnerability scores or they were more school ready. The biggest differences we see are on the language and cognitive development as well as the communication and general knowledge domains with those who attended junior kindergarten having far lower vulnerability rates in these areas. Despite the promising findings, the JK non JK comparison is based on only one year of data. We wanted to bring it here to show you that this information does show promise. Um, the number of students we're talking about are rather low. We can't be absolutely definitive, but this preliminary, this gives us a good preliminary sense of, of where things are going in relation to junior kindergarten and its potential impact on students. On the next slide, um, we want to give you a sense of what we view to be the benefits for junior kindergarten. 
The NWT education system cannot provide junior kindergarten programming only in some small communities or select communities. It's clear that junior kindergarten is needed in every community. And I just take you back to the previous slide to emphasize what the need is. Not only does the territorial implementation of junior kindergarten fulfill our mandate to offer free, play-based, high-quality care to four-year-olds and be part of creating a universal child care system in the Northwest Territories, it does so in a fiscally responsible manner by using existing infrastructure, the schools that we have in every community but one across the Northwest Territories. We want to use that infrastructure to make junior kindergarten happen. It also provides equitable access to free quality early learning programming for all NWT families with four-year-old children, regardless of their geographic location or socioeconomic status. Junior kindergarten also reduces the cost of living for NWT families by saving families approximately uh, $8,000 to $12,000 in childcare costs per year per four-year-old child. As well, parents who, are now, who would now be able to access junior kindergarten in locations where there is no early childhood programming would be able to consider options for themselves, such as going back to work, going to school, um, or, or undertaking other activities that, um, that they wish to, that having childcare or, or those options frees them up to do. Mr. Chair, I now want to turn uh, the presentation over to Rita to cover the next several slides. Thank you, Ms. Hainer. Ms. Mueller. Thank you, Ms. Hainer. Thank you, Sylvia. So um, if um, I could draw your attention to slide seven. Uh, this is the beginning of, um, of outlining the eight recommendations that came uh, from the independent uh, junior kindergarten review that took place. Uh, that independent review um, uh, looked at the JK implementation that had already occurred in small communities. And this uh, JK review was meant for this 18th assembly uh, to look at those recommendations and the results of the review and was made public in January 2016. This review included consultation with stakeholders such as Aboriginal governments and including the Cleachow government, uh, their representatives, ECE service uh, centre regional superintendents and all of the regional early childhood consultants that work with licensed programs, Aboriginal Head Start staff, the Northwest Territories Teachers Association, superintendents of education and as many parents, teachers and school principals um, as the uh, independent review um, staff were able to um, meet with or consult or uh, send surveys to. The key findings of the review uh, that, um, included that overall uh, for those uh, families um, with children in, in JK and the small communities that JK was positive for both the children and the families. That was one of the findings. And the second was uh, another uh, recommendation was that with the expansion of JK, it really needed to take into account community context. The review also made eight recommendations regarding the territorial expansion of JK, uh, including improvement for engagement, improved curriculum support and teacher training, ensuring a clear communication strategy was in place, and addressing the issue and concerns around funding. ECE has taken into consideration all of the review's eight recommendations and has addressed each of these. Um, still on the same slide, um, as you can see from the first recommendation that parents and educators basically collectively had a positive response to JK. Um, this was seen as one piece in the change to improving overall education outcomes. Teachers and parents have described growth in their junior kindergarten uh, children's or students' numeracy, in their literacy, and overall their development of healthy social skills while in junior kindergarten. The second uh, recommendation and one that uh, we've taken uh, very seriously um, uh, to honour is that um, in expanding JK, it must take into account the community context, the community's strengths and needs, and the existence of quality early childhood programs. So ECE is engaging with key stakeholders to build from those strengths and needs and to support communities with a territorial implementation plan. 
JK will be implemented in every NWT community, but considering the community context will include working with schools and programs to support their decision regarding whether for each uh, school, whether they'll offer full day or half day junior kindergarten programming, the teacher qualifications, um, again, either hiring uh, teachers with a bachelor of education degree or having uh, an instructor who has a, a minimum of a two year early childhood diploma uh, from an accredited um, program. Uh, also, you know, looking at class size, um, configurations and the specific needs of equipment and materials uh, to run a JK program, a play-based equipment, uh, equipment that's required, looking at infrastructure and the teacher training. On slide eight um, are the are three more of the recommendations. Uh, the third one in uh, recognizing that equity must be considered uh, for the funding. In most cases, there was an acknowledgement that JK is a beneficial early childhood initiative as early childhood programs are commonly located in schools for four-year-old children. Schools have provided space to accommodate right now uh, current paid preschool programs as well as including some of the Aboriginal Head Start programs and most recently um, junior kindergarten in our small community schools. ECE is moving toward, uh, forward in a fiscally responsible way as our Deputy Minister has stated by using that existing infrastructure and school space that is already well maintained and inspected. And um, in order to invite this early childhood practice um, into, the, into the communities. And it's essential that we continue working with education authorities uh, regarding funding for their particular um, regions. The fourth uh, recommendation, um, expand implementation of JK, JK needs a clear communication strategy. We're committed to strengthen our communication approach and to develop improved uh, approaches around the implementation uh, for all of our stakeholders, including for parents, so that they know what to expect. And we do have a communication plan that has been approved. The fifth uh, recommendation, uh, regarding decisions, um, decisions regarding appropriate uh, pupil teacher ratios within the school setting. Uh, um, currently, the child uh, daycare standard regulations requires a minimum staff ratio of eight to one for young children who care in mixed group settings. So uh, between uh, 25, uh, oh sorry, for children, that includes children under um, 25 months. However, uh, the ratio also sets out a nine to one ratio for uh, mixed groups that have children over 25 months and up to five years old. JK will be funded at a ratio of 12 to one. While both programs include four-year-olds, in daycare settings, they are the oldest of all the children ranging in age from zero uh, to um, three years old. And four-year-olds really do require, um, or the zero to three require additional supervision and care. Whereas in JK classrooms, our junior kindergarten four-year-olds will be the youngest um, of all the children in the school. And uh, in most cases, in small communities, they will be grouped with five-year-old children as well. The 12 to one ratio also addresses the additional personnel and resources available in schools such as having a principal, often an assistant principal. They have program support teachers, classroom assistants, and then other support staff, sometimes including counselors or other, other staff. Decisions regarding class size, uh, the teachers that are hired and the supports are made by the education authorities. It will be up to schools to allocate the funding to meet the needs of their specific circumstance, including how they arrange class size, uh, their multi-grade classrooms where that does exist and any kind of assistant or supports um, that are needed for those classrooms. On sli slide nine are the remaining three recommendations. Um, for the sixth recommendation, professional development and training are a key component to supporting junior kindergarten and kindergarten teachers. Ongoing supports uh, have been made available and will continue to be available through a variety of methods such as in-person, in-servicing and training, as well as teleconferences. 
There are already teachers delivering JK in 19 of our communities and 20 starting in January uh, communities will offer JK. As well, there are kindergarten teachers throughout the education system with well-developed skills in supporting children through play-based curriculum. We will build from these strengths to support other teachers in the delivery of junior kindergarten uh, curriculum, including monthly webinars and in-person training that will occur this spring and also in the fall of 2017. Recommendation 7 uh, talks about the curriculum and uh, the teacher resources and this NWT integrated curriculum and implementation guide has been revised based on the feedback that we received uh, from teachers and principals and it has been and renewed including a much strengthened uh, JKK teacher resource guide. The whole curriculum is built from a culturally appropriate play-based um, philosophy and additional supports and materials have been added to help teachers implement the curriculum to meet the specific needs of students in their community. And as our Deputy Minister has already stated, every single one of our kindergarten classes uh, will be receiving one-time funding to purchase play-based equipment specific to four and five years old. And the last recommendation that the GNWT needs to engage multiple stakeholders in a process, um, again, based on the findings of the review. Uh, engagement since the review was released um, started in May of 2016, and it will continue until um, the end of this month. Uh, to date, engagement has included stakeholders such as licensed early childhood operators, Aboriginal Head Start uh, staff, JK and K teachers and school principals, education superintendents, and the Northwest Territories Teachers Association. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mueller. Mr. Lovely. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so the JK strategy for implementing junior kindergarten across the Northwest Territories, um, we have listened to what our stakeholders have said and we've made some adjustments, uh, adjustments to how that is going to roll out. So the first item there that you will see is that uh, it is going to be free and it's going to be at the discretion of the parents to enroll their children. Uh, as mentioned previously, the funding ratio for JK teachers will be 12 students for every uh, instructor in that classroom. Uh, staff must have a minimum of a two-year diploma in early childhood development from an accredited institution or a Bachelor of Education degree. Um, it'll be up to each of the uh, education authorities to determine what, what uh, qualifications they will have in that classroom. And finally, uh, the major change that we made is that the program can be full day or half day so as to not interfere with existing community programs and will be at the discretion of the local DEA. This will uh, ensure that uh, any negative impacts to other operators in the community will be mitigated. Uh, if we turn to slide 11, uh, the estimated cost for the implement implementation of junior kindergarten is $5.1 million. Um, there is financial flexibility within the education system. Um, the current legislation um, requires that we fund at a, at a minimum ratio of 16 to 1 uh, PTR and that we fund in schooling at 15 per, uh, sorry, 18 percent, no, 15 percent, sorry. Um, currently, based on our 15, 16 enrollments, uh, we currently have a PTR of 13.4 to 1 and in, an inclusive schooling uh, percentage of 17.1. So we're well above what we are required to fund by legislation. Uh, despite this, uh, we will still be injecting $2 million uh, to help offset the cost of the implementation of junior kindergarten. However, um, this will mean that there will be changes required at the, at the uh, schools, um, such as class size and makeup, and possible reductions to authority administration. It also may mean uh, staffing adjustments and changes or limitations to the number of offerings of non-core courses. Um, consistent with the previous rollout that we did for our 19 communities, uh, we will provide additional funding of $15,000 per JK classroom uh, to help purchase equipment and resources to support the JK program. This will include things like uh, water tables, sand tables, and uh, other play-based equipment. 
Uh, if we move over to slide 12, slide 12, uh, we've finalized our enrollment numbers for 1617. And this is important because um, every single year, education authorities' uh, funding will go up or down based on enrollment numbers. So in 2015 16, the enrollment was 8,100 uh, FTEs. Uh, the new enrollment figures in 1617 see an increase of 540 new students to 8,600 um, FTEs. So this increase is made up of two components. The first component is that there are going to be 447 new junior kindergarten students within the system. In communities with JK, the enrollment is based on the actual enrollment uh, for this fiscal year or for this uh, school year. For communities where JK hasn't been implemented, we are projecting 90% uh, of the kindergarten figures. This is based on the uh, experience that we had with the 19 communities, and uh, we feel that this is a, a, a good forecast. There are also um, 93 new students within the system. The cost of those students is $1.3 million approximately. Um, we're not asking education authorities to fund that internally, we are going to come forward to the Legislative Assembly and through our forced growth process uh, to seek that money to help offset the cost. So the figures that you'll see will incorporate the $1.3 million or do not incorporate the additional funding. If we um, move to slide 13, uh, this shows the cost for 16, 17 enrollments. Sure. Uh, Mr. Lovely? Sure. Ms. Green, just clarify. I, I see it in small print here. So. Sorry to bother Okay, you. sorry, Mr. Lovely. Proceed. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so based on new enrollments uh, with a projected 447 new JK students, uh, the cost to implement, as I mentioned previously, is $5.1 5 .5, million. Uh, the difference between the ongoing and the net change is what we're asking education authorities to fund. Internally, that will be $3.1 million. Uh, the net impact of these changes, because of the way we're going to roll this out, is that we will see funding for 17 new FTEs across the education system. Um, there are some changes because, as we see throughout the system, enrollments will fluctuate. Uh, for example, in Daycho, uh, 40 students are no longer um, within the system, they've moved out or have graduated. So in some uh, education authorities, the funding will go down, and in some education authorities, the funding will go up based on enrollments. Slide 14 is the uh, how we plan on funding JK. Um, originally, when we had d decided to, or proposed rolling this out, we had looked at funding um, teaching staff at the midpoint, um, but because uh, a number, as an education system as a whole, it would provide us with the savings that we would have, but because some authorities have teachers with um, a significant amount of experience, they're paid on the higher uh, band of, the, of their uh, pay grade, so they would be asked to cover a significant amount of those costs, whereas in other areas, the teachers have less experience and they would have those savings. So because we're, we're segmented as a system, um, that wasn't a feasible approach. So what we did and what we, we were asked to do by the um, education superintendents was just to look at the staffing tables. So when we did that, um, we were able to find $2.6 million by reducing those staffing tables. And the staffing tables, uh, for instance, says that uh, in the, just for example, in the uh, kindergarten to grade nine system, if you had 125 students, you would get seven teachers. Um, what this amounts to is approximately 1.76% of the entire $150 million. Uh, as we mentioned previously, there's $2 million in new investment. And in the education authorities, there are a number of staff who are UNW uh, employees. Um, in the GNWT, our UNW employees, the departments, we fund them at the midpoint of the salary range. So an employee who is at the uh, salary range of 10 um, 
they would get funded at 10 step four. So any education authority who has a position at 10 step three would have the savings between those two, two amounts. And if alternatively, they would have to find in, internally that money if, there were, if the employee was at say 10 step six. Uh, because of this change and to make it consistent with how we fund GNWT departments for similar employees, uh, we were able to find $445,000. And uh, essentially those are the three pots of uh, funding allocations that we'll be, we will be utilizing to fund junior kindergarten. In addition, uh, there's going to be funding for $15,000 for every classroom in the community that offers junior kindergarten, and that amounts to $525,000. Uh, we will be investing that new money um, ourselves. And then uh, we will be seeking uh, capital funding through the capital planning process of $2.8 million, and uh, we plan to roll that out over three years. Um, this amounts to uh, approximately $8.46 million uh, in, in the first uh, year of implementation. If we move to slide 15, this is the impact on the proposed funding for each of the education authorities. Um, again, as I mentioned, um, we are asking right now to fund the additional 93 new students internally, but we will be seeking uh, a forced growth adjustment to uh, access additional funding so that we can inject that back into the school system. Um, yeah, so the dark blue bar that you see uh, is the 16, 17 figures that we provided to education authorities this, this school year. And the amount in the light blue is the figure that we have projected for 17, 18, including uh, junior kindergarten. Slide uh, 16 um, shows that uh, in 15, 16, we have approximately 1,018 funded teachers. And in 1617, uh, we will we or we will have 1,051 uh, teachers for an increase of 33. This is different than the 17 I said previously, but because the enrollment has gone up by 93, we need additional um, funded positions to help accommodate that. Uh, if we move to slide 17, the infrastructure requirements um, to continue the implementation in the remaining communities and schools, we went out and we did a survey uh, with all the school principals to understand what the requirements are in each of the schools that will be delivering junior kindergarten. And uh, as, a, as, a base, as a result of that survey, we understood what the needs are out there and uh, we prioritize those needs and we'll be seeking funding through the regular process to um, make those changes. Slide 18 essentially shows you uh, what we are planning on doing, um, how that $2.8 million will be sought. So in 1718, we already have $400,000 uh, for the existing uh, renovations that we have to do in the 19 communities. Uh, there's four, four left that we have to do. Uh, there's $550,000 in infrastructure requirements that, are, that we need to do um, next year, uh, this summer, actually, to accommodate the students. Those are the high priority um, items. And then in 18, 19, 19, 20, we'll be going through the appropriate planning processes to accommodate that. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll pass that presentation back to uh, Ms. Hainer. Thank you, Mr. Lopley. Ms. Hainer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In the last slide of the presentation, we just wanted to give you a sense of the next steps. We will be completing the junior kindergarten engagement process in the next couple of weeks. And um, then moving our focus to completing the implementation plan, which we hope to have finalized in January. And obviously that plan will be reflective of the feedback that the many stakeholders have provided during the engagement process. Um, in terms of implementation and what we see um, contained in the implementation plan, um, obviously we'll be continuing, as, as, as Rita mentioned, providing monthly webinars for teachers and ensuring that junior kindergarten teachers are equipped to deliver uh, the curriculum and, and support students. Um, that will include face-to-face -face, uh, in-services as well this spring and in the fall. Um, and 
obviously we will as well continue to work with education <coughs> authorities to provide them the, what supports um, we can and that they need uh, to move forward with planning for implementation in 1718. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Hainer. Uh, at this point in time, um, I thank you for the presentation, open comments. Any questions for the minister? On the whole thing, presentation and uh, opening remarks. Well, I have a few dozen, but uh, um, I guess the first, oh, you do? Sorry. No, you go ahead, Danny. Well, first Mr. Hay McNeely, you, Mr. just wait. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First of all, I, I'd like to thank the uh, minister and all the staff here on providing me with the information, same as the others, on uh, <clears throat> an overview per region, then providing the, uh, the downfalls or problems, then coming up with the financially supported, despite the fact that we're going through some physical challenges, uh, addressing addressing the need, and now showing us an implementation plan. Hopefully the resources are going to be there in the future to keep this carried on. I, I see a lot of value in it. In some cases there I visit the uh, Satu communities and I, I, I get drawn away from this little classroom that's way over onto the side and um, and now that I, I think about the building downtown Toledo, for example, um, I, I see I, I see a lot of merit, having seen the plan here, and visualizing it back in Toledo. So I, I, I'd like to th I'd like to thank the minister and, and your staff for what I think you're doing a good job. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. McNeely. I'll take that, Ms. Minister Moses. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate the comments. Uh, just to give you a little uh, insight, the um, with all the concerns that have been coming up with junior kindergarten, uh, the staff has worked very hard and diligently to uh, find the best solutions possible. We've kept on going back to the, uh, I guess you'd say, the drawing board, looking within our, our own department to look for funds and uh, ways we can uh, implement junior kindergarten program that would. Uh, meet the needs of all communities and all our stakeholders uh, moving forward. So really appreciate the uh, the comments uh, uh, from from Member uh, McNeely, and uh, even moving forward as as uh, the member has mentioned in the house before about uh, other daycare programs that when we do get a tour of the SATU that we will be bringing those packages in to uh, meet with Land Corps to see how we can address those. Uh, we just met with the uh, SATU Secretariat as well and and brought that up as a concern for. Uh, early childhood programming, but um, really appreciate the work because the staff has been been going back and just trying to look and finding ways we can uh, implement junior kindergarten uh, to, to meet the needs of um, our communities. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Minister Moses. Ms. Green. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm sure you've contemplated this and I would like to hear your response to it. Um, if this is such a good thing, why are there so many concerns with it? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Green. Minister Moses. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And if you look at the uh, the one slide there that uh, students uh, went through junior kindergarten and uh, ones that didn't, I believe it was on slide uh, five, we're seeing some really good uh, results in terms of uh, the five domains that are uh, measured under the EDI. Uh, we are getting some concerns with uh, some of the daycares, as I mentioned in my opening comments, uh, in, in here in Yellowknife for sure, and some of the other regionals, Aboriginal Head Start's another one. We've had a lot of meetings with all the uh, stakeholders. Uh, we have 19 communities right now that are offering junior kindergarten program. Uh, 20 coming up in, uh, in the new year, that's gonna be about 60, somewhere around 64% of our communities that are gonna be offering the program. So we are here in concerns, and we are uh, we try to address them as best we could, uh, and that's why we're here today to sh show what our implementation is. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Moses. Ms. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Where is the money that GNWT is putting towards this program coming from? I hear it's coming internally. Where, which program pot or pots is it coming from? Thank you, Ms. Green. Yeah, well, Minister, sorry, Minister Moses. Yeah, one point five million dollars of that is new money, and then we looked within our own department and found another uh, five hundred thousand dollars. I'll go to uh, Mr. Lovely for the details on the five hundred thousand dollars. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Moses. Mr. Lovely. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as part of the ERI, we were able to reduce the scope of work on a number of the uh, projects, and we were able to find $500,000 annually. It just stretches out the length of the project rather than compressing it over a shorter time period. Uh, Mr. Um, Lovely, could you explain what EIR, EIR is? Oh, sorry, uh, <laughs> Mr. Chair, uh, the Education Renewal Initiative. Okay. Thank and uh, in terms of the capital, we'll be seeking that funding through the regular um, capital planning and O&M processes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Lovely. Mr. Tester. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, sorry, I was just seized on that last, uh, that last response. Um, on the, the, the capital needs assessment, um, with the addition of new, of, of essentially a new grade and new students, um, what I have heard from school boards is this is pushing up the capacity issues in many of our schools uh, here in the capital. Has the department taken that into consideration that school capacity ratios are going to be increased with the addition of a new grade? And um, have they taken that assessment uh, into, or are they working on that needs assessment? <coughs> so if we have some schools, <coughs> excuse me. Moving into 90%, 80% utilization rates and bumping them up the list for, for uh, infrastructure improvements. Like, how, how are they, and we factor that into the cost of, of implementing this program. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tester. <coughs> Minister Moses. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, yes, we did look at the enrollment rates right across the, uh, right across the board. Uh, in our legislation, when a uh, school gets a capacity of 85%, then we look at making any kind of uh, uh, either adding to the school or making the renovations that are needed. Uh, right now, there, there's a couple schools that we do need to talk to. Uh, I know YCS is one in particular in terms of uh, uh, utilization rates and uh, looking at the schools on how we can distribute um, uh, the enrollment rates between the schools. But uh, we will be meeting with all the schools to address their needs and looking at uh, utilization rates, which we usually do uh, regardless of uh, adding in, uh, adding junior kindergarten. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Moses. Mr. Tester. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, both of the schools in my riding have expressed concerns about the utilization and uh, that um, the, it, this implementation will, will push that, that their rates up. So I appreciate the department's looking at that. I do think that needs to be a consideration of the implementation. Um, because it will drive costs. Um, my second question, Mr. Chair, is um, how does the minister respond to comments that have been made by the school boards that essentially the, the government is asking school boards and DEAs to um, run 13 grades with a budget for 12? And uh, we've heard that that's partially funded um, and the rest needs to come within. But how does the minister respond to that, that criticism of, of the implementation? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Tester. Minister Moses. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, as I mentioned, we did have a meeting on Friday with all the uh, school board chairs and the superintendents in terms of uh, uh, looking at a whole bunch of education uh, concerns and needs. And uh, we, we do fund our education uh, authorities over $150 million. So uh, as I mentioned in my opening comments that I do believe that our education authorities can work together to look at finding that uh, extra $3.1 million from within in terms of uh, administratively uh, looking at where they can, can uh, have that, that input without affecting other programs. And as uh, uh, Mr. Lovely said before, looking at some of those uh, non-core programs that some of the schools and authorities also offer. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Moses. Mr. Blake. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, in, in my writing, I get 
you know, a lot of mixed messages. I mean, uh, with, from the schools, I know they are eager to take on junior kindergarten. Uh, but then we have two communities as well that have Head Start, both Fort McPherson and Aklavik. And, you know, the Head Start operators are worried that JK will affect the funding of Head Start because they, they, they are noticing that the attendance is going down because parents are bringing the children to JK and, you know, and they just want to be assured that uh, JK will not actually affect their funding. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Blake. Minister Moses. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and <clears throat> I appreciate all members as you, uh, as we've been trying to roll out uh, junior kindergarten that you've been getting a lot of uh, concerns from uh, whether it's Aboriginal Head Start or, or other daycare providers in the Northwest Territories. Um, we did meet, as I mentioned, with, uh, with Aboriginal Head Start. Um, Canadian Public Health Agency of Canada has mentioned that uh, their funding will not be uh, uh, impacted. Uh, we actually fund Junior Kindergarten or uh, Aboriginal Head Start as well, and that funding will not be, uh, be uh, uh, impacted as well. Um, places like Fort McPherson, we're looking as mentioned at half day or full day junior kindergarten in McPherson would be, be great to have, you know, Aboriginal Head Start in the morning and then junior kindergarten in the afternoon be full day uh, early childhood programming for, for families. So, uh, and we'll be up in McPherson in the, in the new year. So uh, we'll definitely look at trying to have a, a meeting with the Aboriginal Head Start folks. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Minister Moses. Mr. Blake. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's actually what, what's happening right now. Uh, you know, they go to junior kindergarten in the morning and then uh, head start in the afternoon. And, but the other thing is uh, with the ratio that's a little higher than, like it's 12 to 1. Uh, I know it's come up in the Clavic, for example. Uh, there's a concern that you know, there, there's a need for assistance, you know, even if we have eight, eight children. Uh, because, you know, in some, some communities, uh, you know, we have children with either Down syndrome or FASD, you know, uh, that need a little extra assistance. And, uh, you know, the principals uh, know the community and they know the needs that, that they're going to have in the coming year, and you know, I'm hoping that we could assist them. And thank, you. thank you, Mr. Blake. Minister Moses. Yeah, and that was one of the uh, items on the agenda last week when we spoke with all the uh, DECs as well as the uh, superintendents and staff about inclusive schooling and uh, some of the uh, education renewal uh, work that we're, we're doing as well. But I'll ask uh, uh, Rita if she wants to add anything to that. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Moses. Ms. Mueller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister. Uh, so just to reiterate, uh, it's really working well in Fort McPherson right now uh, with having the Aboriginal Head Start uh, in the school and across the hallway from junior kindergarten. And as you mentioned, uh, uh, Emily Blake, um, the kids are going to the <coughs> half-day program. Aboriginal Head Start has always been half-day uh, programming for three- and four-year-olds. And so the four-year-old uh, go to half a day and then the other half a day. And what they're finding is is that uh, parents really like that uh, opportunity. The ratio, uh, the 12 to 1 um, for junior kindergarten across the north seems like a very reasonable uh, ratio. And again, the difference is that when junior kindergarten for four years old is offered in the school, the four years old are not going to be the oldest in a program like they are in licensed uh, programs. They're going to be the youngest. And in a lot of our communities, it will be a mixed uh, classroom environment of four- and five-year-old children. And what a school has as an advantage is that they have a, a tremendous amount of other supports that a licensed uh, early childhood program doesn't necessarily have, uh, such as you know, principals, uh, highly trained teachers, uh, support staff, and um, access to other services as well. So to address your concern about little ones coming in at four years old into JK with needs, we know that that's definitely um, a reality everywhere across the Northwest Territories. Uh, but we're confident that the school system will be able to support their needs. 
Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mueller. Mr. O'Reilly. <clears throat> Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I guess I want to start with some comments, and I want to start with some good ones, but then I'm going to move into some things that I'm concerned about. So, um, look, I recognize that, and, and it's indisputable, that JK is a good thing. Absolutely, and that I, I believe that the minister and his staff are, are working very hard to try to do this. The issue, I think, is implement. One of the issues is implementation. But um, I guess my, my first concern is the way in which MLAs are finding out about this. Two days ago, there was a briefing for the media uh, about this, and I'm finding out through the media about an extra five hundred thousand dollars that the department has come up with internally. Um, I don't think that briefing the media before even talking to the MLAs is consistent with our process convention. So this is a continuing pattern that I see with uh, cabinet announcements and uh, I want the department, I, you know, you, you, you can work with your cabinet colleagues. This is not appropriate that we find out about this after the media. So that's just for your information. My second concern though is um, it's this fiscal target that continues to drive uh, uh, the reduction program that our government is uh, is following. What essentially is happening here is we're offloading the uh, extra costs now for JK uh, onto the, the school boards and students uh, and families and so on, and that's not appropriate. Um, uh, and I disagree with that approach. So I'm wondering uh, what can the, the minister and the department do to look at ways in which we can come up with the extra $3.1 million or another portion of that so that we're not offloading our fiscal reduction targets onto the school boards. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Minister Moses. Yeah, thank you for the, uh, the comments. I uh, appreciate the, uh, the communication concerns. Uh, this was the only time we could get before committee in terms of the scheduling. Uh, we did want to uh, make sure that we briefed the, all the board chairs and the superintendents before doing that uh, media release. And uh, so we didn't get out to the media at all until after we, uh, we met with the superintendents to give them the information, then the board chairs. And unfortunately, this was the only time that we get before committee. Uh, we wanted to get that information out as soon as we got that information to the board chairs and superintendents uh, because there's been so much uh, going on in the media right now that we wanted to get, get our stance out there. So uh, appreciate the uh, communication concern and, and try to do better uh, moving forward. Um, in terms of the fiscal target, um, we are investing the $8 million this year, over $8 million. And uh, much what I said to the, uh, the board chairs is something that we'll see what we can do within our department to see if there's a possibility of finding any, any more funding. But uh, as I mentioned, because of the uh, fiscal realities that we're facing among all departments, it's, it's very uh, challenging at this, at this moment. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Moses. Mr. Riley. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair, and uh, uh, I appreciate the answer from the Minister and the, the timing issues and so on. I know there's a lot of balls uh, in motion and so on, so I, I appreciate that, but uh, I, I think he's heard my comment on that. I want to turn to slide five, if I could, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, and uh, I'm wondering what the basis is for sort of this, uh, the data here. Is this based on, like, uh, uh, two years of data um, where we can compare kids before and after JK or communities with and without JK um, and is this sort of uh, similar to uh, what happens in other jurisdictions and the reason why I'm asking this is uh, um, I'm trying to sort out whether investing in JK is going to give us the biggest bang for our buck whether if we had invested the same amount of money in uh, kids earlier zero to three what sort of outcomes would we expect and, um, you know, I think that's a reasonable question, and I'm sure that the department has been thinking about this, but uh, if we were to take the same amount of money and invest it in zero to three, would we get a bigger bang for our buck and, and get our kids uh, better prepared for schooling than investing in JK? Uh, I, I understand from what the minister said that we've got existing infrastructure and so on at the schools that we can more easily use for JK, but will we get a bigger bang for a buck investing the same amount in, in early childhood development, zero to three? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Minister Moses. The yeah. um, department's doing a, a number of things. Uh, as, you, as you know, we've increased the uh, early childhood program 
uh, dollars to all our uh, operators. We continue to fund Aboriginal Head Start as well. Um, we're developing a curriculum for early childhood uh, operators. Uh, we, we're working in partnership with Health and Social Services on the early childhood development framework. And, um, and the realities are that uh, in some of our communities, there's no uh, daycare, daycares or day homes. And uh, junior kindergarten is, uh, is a great option to, to do that. Uh, the younger that we can invest in our, our children, definitely the better. Um, our realities in, in some of our communities is that we don't have the daycare, day homes, and we gotta utilize uh, uh, the space that we have, which is in, in schools, offering junior kindergarten. Thank you. And uh, actually, I'll go to uh, Mr. Lovely for some more further detail Thank on you. the uh, results. Thank you, Minister Moses. Mr. Lovely. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll speak to the um, the data that we have here. So this is data that we have for one year of junior kindergarten um, implementation. What you have is a cohort who has had no prior um, license-based care whatsoever <coughs> um, prior to entering into kindergarten for those in uh, red. And the, the cohort that is identified in green, those are students in junior kindergarten who have also had no prior license-based care. So what it's showing is that students who are in grade five, let's say under communication and general knowledge, 56.1% of them are vulnerable. For students who attended JK but no license-based prior care are 24.3% vulnerable. So there's a significant gap between the two um, groups of children. I hope that answered your question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Lovely. Uh, Mr. Bolio. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Um, Mr. Chairman, just a, uh, a few comments. I think that junior kindergarten uh, is a good program for, for students. I think it would, uh, at the end of the day, will increase our uh, graduation rates by giving us uh, better results at the, at the, uh, on the um, education and development instrument point and uh, uh, midpoint of uh, kindergarten. However, I think the problem is with funding. In, in the South Slave, we have issues with uh, long-term teachers. So um, an example, uh, Fort Smith and, and Hay River have teachers that have been there for a long time. So they're beyond uh, the midpoint. And I'm sure Yellowknife is generally the same way. Um, and they're beyond the midpoint. So automatically as the, 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 the system is rolled out and teachers are funded at a certain level, uh, sort of midpoint level, then all of the schools that have long-term teachers uh, are being underfunded uh, to start with. Um, I think that the, 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 um, the ratios are also, um, if, the, if the government uh, or the department is looking at ratios uh, across the territory, then that creates problems. We have some, some schools which have a minimum amount of teachers, but the ratio is still well below uh, what, it, what the, the ratio that, uh, that is being used uh, across the board. <coughs> However, um, so I, that puts pressure on the, on the bigger schools. So, um, so it's a little bit um, unusual, I find, that, uh, and that the ratios are, are applied that way. But, uh, but um, um, it just seems like, um, um, like, you know, statistics aside, um, we have teachers that are working long hours, uh, working very hard to educate our, our children. Uh, to do the best they can to educate children. And what the Department of Education has essentially done is given them more work and, and not the money to, to support the, the work that they're doing. So the teachers are operating at a very high level uh, right now with uh, not much uh, uh, free time uh, in, in the system. Now this is m make it even less so. And we want uh, um, teachers that want to put their best foot 
best foot forward to educating people. When you add four-year-olds, and, and any in any investor will tell you that investing in early childhood development is the greatest investment ever, um, greater than any other investment uh, out there. Uh, uh, the department seems to have just kind of thrown it in and then said, well, we'll give you $2, $2 million on something that's probably going to essentially cost uh, the schools about $7 million, actually. And so the people in the, in, that I represent, at any event, uh, are not pleased with it. They're, they think that if you're going to put in a program, a new program, then you should just fund the program. Not play with the numbers and say, well, you have a, a PTR here or you have the mid-range teacher here. And just overall, the funding. And the other thing is on early on Aboriginal Head Start. It's attractive for Aboriginal Head Start to have four-year-olds because of their ratios. So when they have an instructor that has looked, ha, is now going to be responsible for three-year-olds, then the ratio is lower. So um, you need one teacher for eight students. Uh, Four-year-olds are an attractive part of Aboriginal Head Start. So I think that um, uh, we should support Aboriginal Head Start in communities where they exist. And I recognize that there's only eight, eight areas where they have Aboriginal Head Start. And maybe it's working well in McPherson because they're in the school as well. I, I, I don't know. Uh, I've only talked to Aboriginal Head Start that affect the, the riding I, I represent, and, and they're not happy. So I just... Um, on paper, I think these things sound okay, but I think realistically, I think we just need to to look at it and say, if it's a good program, then let's put our money behind it. I mean, I think this government should, you know, as a government overall, we would support the communities to say, there's more money needed in order for us to fully and properly implement junior kindergarten. And so we can implement junior kindergarten, that's true. With $2 million, that can happen, right? It's going to happen. But if you want to implement it properly and you want good results down the road and you want happy teachers and happy school boards, then we should fund junior kindergarten. And I think that's what the, the problem is. We're just, uh, we're using statistics, you know, uh, and statistically, right across the territories, when you use all, um, I don't know, 8,100 students, uh, and, and you apply, you apply the, the uh, pupil-teacher teacher ratios to it, then all of these things fit, but that's not that cut and dried. And so uh, as far as the... Um, uh, the people I've talked to, I would have to say that uh, uh, they're very concerned. And, 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 and like I said, two, two of the bigger communities in the South Slave that are m mostly affected, uh, and not, not, not my writing, but they are in the same school uh, education council. So it impacts everyone because they're responsible for the whole region. And, and, and that is the fact that their long-term teachers uh, are not being funded at the long-term teacher rate. So their pay is beyond what the, what, what the, the formula calls for. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bolio. Minister Moses. Yeah, so A lot of things in there. Um, in terms of uh, the funding, uh, we are contributing $8 million this, this first year. Um, talked about the ratios. Uh, we're legislated to uh, fund at 16 to 1. Uh, we currently fund at 13.4 to 1, so we're actually funding uh, above our uh, legislated um, uh, ratios. Uh, inclusive schooling as well. I know there's a lot of concerns out there for uh, students that need that extra assistance. We're legislated at 15% for inclusive schooling, but we're funding at 17%, so there's uh, extra dollars out there to, to assist. And that was one of the uh, discussions we had on Friday with the board chairs was around inclusive schooling and how do we, how do we address that. Uh, I know that uh, teachers, um, 
the workload is a big concern of them. I've been attending some of the LRO meetings in the regions, listening to the representatives that are speaking on behalf of uh, the teachers in the schools. And um, they, they just did a collective agreement with the, uh, the 100 hours of uh, personal time. So, I mean, uh, that was uh, a, a big thing. And I, I do understand the, uh, uh, the point that uh, Member Boley was trying to make in terms of that all schools are different. And that when you look at statistically, uh, that 13.4 uh, ratio doesn't apply to all schools and the utilize, utilization rates that were brought up earlier uh, with junior kindergarten uh, implementation will be funding uh, 17, 17 new uh, full-time employees uh, to, to, to address that as well. And with Aboriginal Head Start, a really great opportunity to provide uh, half-day JK and half-day half Aboriginal Head Start, which will result in a full day of uh, early childhood programming. And uh, one thing that we're also doing uh, is we're developing an accountability network for all education <coughs> authorities to ensure that uh, dollars that we are, are sending to the authorities are being spent and, and uh, making our authorities uh, uh, more accountable as well. And I'll go to uh, my Deputy Minister in case there was anything there that I, I missed. Thank you, Minister Moses. Ms. Hainer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to clarify on the funding and the reference to the use of the midpoint. Um, we are going ahead to change the funding formula and using the midpoint for UNW employees, but not for teachers. Teachers will continue, those positions will continue to be funded as they have been, which is, is based on the actuals from the year previous. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Hainer. Mr. Bolio? That surprises me. I thought I actually um, heard uh, otherwise just now from Mr. Lovely on, uh, uh, on how the midpoint worked, that when you get funded at a certain level, he used the analogy of somebody that's and, and step 10-4. Uh, oh. uh, that's where they're being funded, but if they were getting, uh, if they were a teacher that was at step 10-3, that there would be extra money there. So that's that's what I, I understood and also understood that from, uh, that should probably be communicated to the um, uh, education councils, at least in the, in the South Slave, because they think that, uh, uh, I'm, in fact, um, I just got an email from them on, on that uh, exact item, on how, how the funding was. So if it's, if p teachers have been funded at the rate that they are, that they are at, so the senior guys are getting funded, Funded at the top of the scale, that's great, uh, but I, that's that's not their understanding, so uh, that's okay. Um, the um, 100 hours of uh, in, instructional time, I, um, I'm not a or a, a personal time for teachers. I'm not 100% sure uh, of uh, how that works because uh, I'm not a teacher. But I do understand that there is a certain amount of work that a student has to do during the year in order to advance to the next level. So if you're taking um, uh, 100 hours uh, of personal time out of the instructional of students, is there other uh, positions that uh, would replace that uh, that um, gap in order to make sure that uh, uh, the students are uh, fulfilling their entire mandate in order to advance from one grade to the next. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bolio. Minister Moses. Thank you, and and uh, that was the uh, the meeting that we had on Friday. Uh, to update all the uh, board chairs and superintendents about the midpoint. Initially, that was how we were going to look at trying to fund but uh, when we looked at it, we just scrapped the idea, but we did give the, an update to all our board chairs, and um, hopefully they'll get that information out to their, their members. Uh, the 100 hours, that was something that was negotiated between uh, uh, the NWT Teachers Association and, and their membership as well, but uh, I'll, I'll go to Sylvia for a little bit more detail, and then maybe uh, Rita can speak to the, uh, some of the, the 100 hours as well. Thank you, Minister Moses. Ms. Hainer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the acknowledgement for the hard work that teachers do. We certainly agree uh, on that point. Um, and the 100 hours uh, was agreed to through the negotiation process with the Teachers Association quite recently. 
from everything that you've heard today, I think you'll agree that the environment within which our teachers are, are asked to do their jobs every day is a very challenging one. The EDI results themselves indicate that we are asking teachers every day in classrooms to do extraordinary work, work beyond what um, you would see in many classrooms in the South. And the 100 hours is a recognition of that that um, that requirement and that expectation. We need time, um, teachers need time to uh, receive additional training and support, time to assess students um, so that they can continue to do their best work and, and provide the support to students. Um, with, with that introduction, I'll just turn it over to Rita to, to expand a bit. Thank you, Ms. Hainer. Ms. Mueller? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So currently in the Northwest Territories, our Education Act uh, prescribes the minimum number of hours that a student must uh, have instruction uh, by a teacher. And what we found over the uh, past several years in all of our work under education renewal and trying to strengthen our education system is that, in fact, the Northwest Territories and Nunavut are, um, have over 100 hours more of prescribed um, a student and teacher instructional time together, the minimum, compared to anywhere else in Canada. So currently um, in the Northwest Territories, um, the minimum requirement is 1,045 hours uh, per school year. And uh, through the work in partnership with the NWTTA, uh, what has been um, negotiated in the recent collective agreement is the beginning of the discussion of how could um, up, to, up to 100 hours be reprofiled to try to better support teachers, as uh, uh, Deputy Minister um, Hainer has suggested, in the things that they are required to do anyway. And so that would really, we've heard from teachers, they need more time for student assessment and to complete report cards, because right now many of them do it in the evenings and weekends. Uh, we've heard very clearly from teachers that when they have the opportunity to have embedded during the day uh, professional development um, opportunities to work together with other colleagues, whether it be in person or even via um, video conferencing or teleconferences, that it improves their instructional practice. And so that really is the goal and to address um, MLA Bolio's concerns about, you know, um, not compromising the hours that students need, really uh, in partnership with the NWTTA, what we're trying to do is to, to uh, have a balance and uh, to make it more in line with the rest of Canada, um, uh, first of all, but also to ensure that however those 100 hours are, are um, reprofiled, that in fact it helps strengthen teachers' instructional practice so that when they are with students, the quality of education is improved. That's the overall goal. Thank you, Ms. Mueller. Mr. Nutley. One more. <clears throat> Mr. Nutley. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to thank the uh, Minister and his staff for giving us an overview on this important initiative. Uh, I realize the significance of this initiative in terms of um, being rolled out and you know, it's been a long process, I think, over the past four years or so, in the previous um, 17th Assembly, so I kind of understand the significance of the rollout. But, you know, I think what we've seen is, um, is uh, some hard work in terms of to trying to bridge the gap between um, you know, the JK fundamental um, pillars in terms of how it is is supposed to work in communities and throughout the NWT, but at the same time, the ongoing concerns with the Aboriginal Head Start program initiatives that have been long established and have been proven very successful. So um, I think what we've experienced as far is that, uh, you know, the JK is moving towards the, the idea of a universal daycare program. It's been studied. There's a recognition of need. And it's a major shift um, at the community level. And uh, what we've seen thus far is this was been rolled out, but, but because of the concerns, you know, we had to kind of backtrack and reflect upon just how it is that was the, the concerns are supposed to be, 
be at least mitigated or else um, maybe at least addressed. So, um, and I'm trying to understand just the concerns that are ongoing. Uh, for example, um, you know, my understanding of the ongoing concerns from the Aboriginal Head Start perspective, uh, the program has been in existence for the past 20 years. As I said, it's uh, proven a, a very successful. Um, it involves communities, parents, and culture and language. And, uh, you know, the, the proponents and supporters of the Aboriginal Head Start initiative, you know, are basically seen the pro the, this program initiative that's been established for the past 20 years helplessly seeing the program being stomped over and that's what it is and unfortunately that's still the ongoing concerns and you know and and as we roll out this JK initiative the unfortunate reality is that uh, within maybe a period of maybe four or else maybe two years, the eight Aboriginal Head Start initiatives, and these are federal initiatives, with a, and, and, and they're, they're going to end, and you know, and that's the concern. So I want to know, most recently in Fort Providence, um, there was a meeting there. What was the purpose of the meeting, and what was the understanding left from your officials in terms of trying to work with the communities to sort out these issues? We'll see. Thank you, Mr. Adley. Minister Moses. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and <clears throat> I do understand the uh, the concerns, specifically with uh, Fort Providence. It's always been a uh, a big concern come, coming from there. Um, our, our discussions with Canadian Public Health Agency of Canada, uh, they they mentioned that they're not looking at expanding uh, Aboriginal Head Start to any of the other communities. So right now it's only in eight communities right across the north. Our focus is on 33 communities and we want to provide uh, uh, for programming in each each uh, one of those communities, and uh, we got to give everybody an equal chance and and an equal opportunity to take on this uh, early childhood programming, uh, junior kindergarten. Um, our uh, assistant deputy minister, uh, Miss Mueller, was in Providence, so I'll get her to speak to uh, speak to to the meeting and the purpose of the meeting and what came out of it. But uh, from my understanding, it was a, a very uh, very good meeting. Thank you, Minister Moses. Ms. Mueller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Minister. So yes, I did have the, the privilege of being in Fort Providence last Tuesday for a public meeting. Um, the meeting was suggested, to have a public meeting was suggested by um, the Aboriginal Head Start program manager uh, for, from Fort Providence, who thought that that would be the best forum to, uh, to discuss you know, uh, the merits of both Aboriginal Head Start and Junior Kindergarten. And so we had a just an incredible turnout. About 45 parents came to that uh, public meeting and it was two and a half hours long. <laughs> and uh, there was a lot of good discussion, but also who attended that meeting was the principal from Degas School, as well as uh, the superintendent of education for the Decho Divisional Education Council. So um, in a takeaway, what did I leave with? I left with the incredible, I was very moved, uh, as I always am, uh, uh, for the passion and the commitment that Aboriginal Head Start have in providing this service in their eight communities, uh, no different in Fort Providence. And uh, they've been doing so for nearly 20 years. That's, I, I took that away. I also took away the fact that uh, JK means to them change, and change is scary. And we're asking them to break uh, a habit or a, a program delivery that they've had for 19 years and to rethink about how they can provide services to younger children. Their mandate from the federal government is zero to five, and in the Northwest Territories, the Aboriginal Head Start programs, for the most part, have all f always offered half-day programming for three- and four-year-old children. They've made that choice, which they're allowed to, not to offer um, for, for zero to two. Uh, I, I think that there's still some worry. Uh, what I took away also was that there's still worry that somehow someone is not telling them the truth about funding. 
And uh, though we've tried to reassure them and in fact brought the public health agency here to Yellowknife to meet with all eight of the uh, programs to talk about funding and to understand that the federal government at this point has no plans to increase the uh, funding to Aboriginal Head Start, but certainly um, that all of their current funding would continue <coughs> and that uh, that in fact, uh, if they reprofiled and worked with two and three year old children instead of four year old children, if that's what they chose to do, that their funding would continue. And we've reassured them as well for the funding that we provide through the licensed uh, child care uh, subsidy that we have. Um, so that, that's really the takeaway is that change is really hard and can be scary. We're asking them to rethink, uh, maybe inviting a younger uh, demographic into their program and uh, also I think that there is um, for some compared to other but in Fort Providence the principal was very um, eloquent in saying that she really believed uh, being born and raised in that community and being the principal of the school for many years that both programs could be successful and that um, what she saw was that Aboriginal Head Start could concentrate more on the culture and the language for their half day programming. And then in her idea was that the other half a day, if the children came to junior, they could concentrate on, on other aspects as well. And that both programs could work together to provide the predicted seven four year olds in Fort Providence next year with a high quality early learning opportunity where both programs would run and be successful. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mueller. Mr. Natalie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to uh, seek to understand. Um, there's one statement that was made in. At the, I think, as I understand, I wasn't there at the meeting. Um, was was to the effect of the, the fate of the Aboriginal Head Start program initiative. Um, does does the minister um, is aware through his federal colleagues whether there's a long term. Uh, commitment to continue with the Aboriginal Head Start initiative from what I understand that um, G, um, the um, Aboriginal Head Start funding is going to cease to exist as of uh, 2020. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Natalie. Minister Moses. At this time, uh, no, but I know they did extend uh, the contract services for Aboriginal Head Start, and uh, at this time, I don't uh, see it uh, diminishing at all, but we continue to uh, uh, advocate on behalf of the program because we know how important all our early childhood programs are and the uh, services that they provide in all of our communities. So uh, that's something we'll continue to uh, advocate for. Yeah. Thank you, Minister Moses. Ms. Green. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I'd just like to start by saying that I find the response changes hard, very patronizing. I think that what we're doing here is trying to work out some very real problems. They go beyond the fact that people are being change resistant. They're very committed to the education of their children and they, they want the best for them, which I know is what we all want. Um, I have both of the Yellowknife school boards in my riding and what they're facing is um, reduced support for salaries because salaries will be averaged rather than paid at the actual level. Uh, reduced support for inclusive schooling and that's despite the fact that both school boards uh, put their own revenue into inclusive schooling and reduced revenue from the programs that they now charge for. And so what, what is happening here is that we, the voters in Yellowknife, have elected these school boards to represent our concerns um, about giving our children a good education. And they are being told by the department to um, fund programs um, out of money they don't, they don't have at the expense of other children in their schools. So the, the slide notes already that um, non-core courses won't be offered. That, that is not acceptable. We can't have a school system that is oriented in its funding and outlook to, to JK at the expense of, of the other grades. And, and a 2% uh, cut to their funding um, by asking them to fund JK 
uh, out of their own money is not acceptable. So the very real problem here, which has still not been addressed, is how this program is going to be funded. We don't need any more platitudes about what a great program it is, what good things it does for children. That is not a point I've heard anyone argue about. But I haven't been satisfied in hearing that this program will not be funded at the expense of other children, at, at the expense of the school boards providing other programming, and at the expense of children who need inclusive schooling, which unfortunately is a very large number. And so I, I, I challenge you, instead of just shouting louder and, and, and squat, trying to distance the dissent, to really engage in those issues of why, uh, of how you expect this program to be funded. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Green. And Mr. Moses. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And <clears throat> as, as we mentioned with the, uh, the salaries, the, the midpoint, that was taken right off the, the books in terms of uh, looking at funding. Initially, it was looked at uh, as an option to get the funding, but that was, we, we looked at it and we knew we couldn't do it, so that was out. Uh, inclusive schooling, as I mentioned, we met with the, uh, the board chairs last Friday, as I, I uh, uh, mentioned to uh, Member Bolio that uh, we're re revisiting that. It was a big concern from the, uh, the, the board chairs and superintendents, so we're looking at that and revisiting it in terms of uh, the work moving forward. I still got to still gotta say that uh, we're legislated to, to fund the authorities at 15% for inclusive schooling. We're funding our school boards at uh, 17%. Uh, and you look at uh, some of the um, developmental uh, concerns within those domains, within the EDI results, and if we invest in, in our early childhood programs, uh, as that bar graph showed, even though it's just the uh, one-year statistics, we're going to start seeing some positive results that will hopefully uh, deter some of the funding that we're putting into inclusive schooling. Uh, core programming, uh, we got to look at uh, what we're providing in terms of uh, what courses are needed for students in the NWT and, uh, and um, also look at uh, what we're mandated to, to do in the 18th Assembly and that's uh, provide early childhood uh, programming. But we are engaging with all the authorities moving forward. I'll go to uh, Mr. Lovely <clears throat> in case there's anything that I, I might have missed. Okay, thank you, Minister Moses. Mr. Lovely. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to um, further clarify uh, Minister Moses' statement. Um, each school authority is funded at the average salary for their teachers from the prior year. So we are not funding teachers at the midpoint. Uh, the second thing um, I wanted to clarify was that, yes, the schools will be losing revenue from not offering the preschool programs to four-year-olds, but that is going to be replaced with government funding uh, which is substantially higher per child than they would receive from parents. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Lovely. Ms. Green? Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Chair, I, I'm, I understand the answers, but I'm still not satisfied that a school system that I support with my taxes, that I elect trustees to run, is in a position to take on this extra year of education without more support from the department. Further, my concern is that if uh, it isn't properly funded, the results will not be as encouraging as we all hope they will be um, because there will be too many compromises to get to that point, so everything will be done at, uh, at half speed. The report, from the review of the junior kindergarten asks you to consider that one size does not fit all. And to be perfectly honest, I haven't heard any acknowledgement of that point at all. What I've heard, first of all, was that it was going to be introduced when and to all schools. And now here we are struggling with all the detail that should have been put out in the first place. So um, uh, I, I don't accept the, the premise that, that the that the department is following the recommend, that the minister is following the the recommendations in this report, and and I still remain very concerned that that JK will be introduced on the backs of the other students, and and I realize that's a comment and not a question. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Green. 
Minister Moses, do you wish to reply or we can go on to? Yeah. Um, we've been hearing those concerns. We've been engaging with the authorities. Uh, YCS already <coughs> offers a four-year-old program. As you heard, Mr. Lovely said that uh, uh, when it becomes uh, uh, junior kindergarten is a free play-based program, that when it is offered, uh, the funding that the department gives will be more than what they would have received from the parents that pay for the, the program itself. And uh, But those are concerns we've always, we've been hearing uh, right through the whole process. And as I mentioned, we're still working with the authorities and the board chairs uh, trying to address these the best we can. As I mentioned, the department's been working very hard in terms of uh, trying to uh, look at implementing junior kindergarten uh, for all our communities in the NWT. And uh, there are challenges. And... Uh, but, you know, we are here today to uh, talk about what we've, we have come up with. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Moses. Mr. Bolio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I, I just wanted to uh, correct myself on uh, when the, the uh, talking about uh, what uh, the South Slave Education uh, Council did relay information to me on their concerns of funding, but it was not teachers. I apologize. So, for saying teachers, their concern was admin staff and UNW staff that were were being funded at midpoint and they had a lot of long-term staff and that was causing a bit of underfunding uh, in those areas. So I just want to clarify that, but I got an email correcting me, so thank you. Thank you. As Ms. Hainer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks, I appreciate um, the clarification. As was referenced earlier, that approach for funding uh, at the midpoint for uh, positions that are within the UNW bargaining unit is a consistent approach across government. And uh, departments currently uh, manage uh, within that kind of an approach, and uh, we would expect that um, you know, there might be some challenges, but that it, it is an, a, manageable, uh, 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 a manageable situation for the education authorities. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Sainer. Um, any other questions? Okay, I do have a few from my list of 12 that still are here. Um, I guess my first comment is great to hear that you guys are actually not going to be looking at the midpoint with teacher salaries because that has a huge impact on my smaller communities. However, I guess I struggle with the equal teacher ratio at 16 to 1. That's still the highest in the, in the nation or close to the highest in the nation. And the fact is that smaller communities affect this, the bigger communities. So I'm hoping that, that you guys will look at this because um, it is a concern because it has a huge impact on our bigger centers and our bigger schools. And I, I know in my riding and my colleagues in this bigger centers, it has have an effect on them as well. So I'm hoping that you can look at that, Minister Moses, in the department as you guys move forward because junior kindergarten in my region is working. We were one of the few uh, people that jumped out on it. But again, they're concerned about the student teacher ratio and the amount of money that's going to be put into it. So uh, that'll be my first comment. If you wish to comment on that, Minister Moses. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> the uh, same issue was brought up at the uh, board chairs meeting on Friday. And uh, we did inform uh, the chairs that we will be looking at the, uh, the PTR uh, and uh, getting back to them. Uh, as well, superintendent from the DHO uh, uh, did speak very highly of the uh, junior kindergarten program that's been run in the communities as well. So uh, uh, it was brought up and we did discuss it with the board chairs. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, I'm just trying to synchronize my questions because like I said, I have a whole bunch, but I'm, I guess my next one is just in regards to the development of language. In regards to language, um, I've heard a lot in my writing that it's important for people in the smaller communities, especially if we're going to develop a language, we need to keep our kids at home. Now this here is being implemented. So what is the department looking at when it comes to the development of language with the junior kindergarten that do not have the Aboriginal Head Start? Because we've only have eight programs and we hear of the success of there. And, um, my colleague talked about Fort Providence, you know, how they worked it. So how are we going to be able to help develop the language? 
um, with as with the implementation of this. Thank you. Minister Moses. Yeah, we do uh, have the curriculum here with us that we can share with uh, with committee. Um, we also are developing an official languages plan that addresses some of the the work that's uh, being done by our official languages board and Revital Aboriginal Revitalizations Board. Uh, that plan should be uh, coming out in the uh, new year and hopefully we'll table it in during the next session. Uh, but I'll, I'll go to uh, Ms. Mueller if she wants to discuss anything about our, our curriculum that we have for junior kindergarten. Thank you, Minister Moses. Ms. Mueller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister. Uh, so um, that development of language and it also goes with sense of identity too for children because we know that's really important that the stronger their sense of who they are, where they come from, um, including the language of their community and of their family, uh, really helps to develop them, is, uh, is essential. And so, like our entire uh, education system, we, we're based on two philosophies, Denica Day and Inikadikit. And those philosophies suggest that our entire education system, uh, JK to grade 12, needs to really reflect the students that we serve. And that includes, of course, uh, to the, the best of the ability uh, to develop Aboriginal language uh, proficiency um, for students that are interested in that or their families are interested in that for them. Uh, one of the things that we're doing right now in the, the DECHO, uh, also in partnership with the University of Victoria through our education renewal for the past two years, and I'm sure you're familiar with it, Mr. Chair, having some real success in um, looking at how a whole school supports development uh, by training teachers and not just language uh, specialists, but also working with principals and uh, other classroom teachers to support language development for all the grades. So that's been a pilot project the past two years um, where we're getting very hopeful results. And another um, point uh, to speak to your concern is that education authorities really have always had the authority and will continue to be able to decide uh, who their staff is. And, uh, and in regards to this, if um, communities are fortunate enough to have uh, early childhood practitioners with two years of a diploma and or a Bachelor of Education degree that also happen to be uh, fluent in their language, the education authority uh, by all means can uh, decide that they might want to have an immersion junior kindergarten program or they might have a stronger uh, language component in the Aboriginal languages for their students. They have the authority to do that right now and they'll continue to have that authority as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mueller. Um, I'm just reflective of the time. I just have one last question so then we can um, move on. But I mean, I just greatly appreciate it. Um, I've talked to a number of chair people. I've talked to a lot of people, a lot of teachers um, in my writing. Um, what, by implementing this, what programs are going to have to come off the table? That Because that's what I've been hearing from the education people. That we keep on giving projects for them, but we don't give them enough funding. And so things have to come off the table. So what has the department and the the DECs talked about that are going to come off the table that will if make ensure that we can fund this program. Uh, Minister Moses? Yeah, and uh, that's solely up to the uh, education authorities on what kind of programs they'd uh, be looking into. Uh, we gave them a target and talked about the, uh, the core programming uh, in terms of uh, what's needed for a student to graduate and that we got to continue with those. But there's also the uh, some of the other uh, non-core programming that some of the schools schools offer. Um, but like I said, it's it's totally up to the uh, education authorities to, to look into that. Okay, thank you. Um, at this point in time, uh, okay, um, I would like to thank Minister Moses uh, and his staff. Oh yeah, and tomorrow hmm. night we will be having uh, public uh, hearing on a number of groups that wish to present to us so that uh, that will be happening tomorrow night at 7. Um, so just so you're aware and your staff and the public is aware that we'll be doing that at 7 tomorrow night. So um, we're trying to we're trying to get more information as we move forward on this. And that decision was just made yesterday because of the, the influx of people requesting to have the meeting. We're, we're, 
we're using every spare minute we can have while we're in here in town. So again, we thank you very much for coming. We thank the general public for attending. And if you have any closing comments, Minister Moses, uh, you may please do so. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. <laughs> I do appreciate the, uh, the questions and the dialogue. Uh, anybody that was around <clears throat> during the 17th Assembly uh, understands the, uh, uh, the com complexity of junior kindergarten. Uh, we've seen some of the results here today in terms of the, uh, the five domains of uh, development and having that one year of junior kindergarten, how it's impacted some of our, our uh, most vulnerable and how it's, uh, it's a positive thing. Um, my staff's been working very hard, as I've mentioned, and I uh, look forward to hearing the results from uh, tomorrow night's meeting. Uh, I'm pretty sure we've heard them all already. We've gotten letters. We've gotten emails from, from all the MLAs pretty well. And, um, yeah, moving forward, I'm just hoping that as we move forward that we can uh, keep, keep the best interest of, of our children and our families and our communities that uh, need early childhood programming so that we can give the best start to our, our children for the future, and uh, that's a focus of this mandate. It was a discussion uh, during caucus, and, and I strongly believe that and look forward to moving and working with committee. Thank you, Minister Moses, and I have to echo you, echo your uh, acknowledgement of your hardworking staff and the teachers, uh, but all government workers and, and non-government workers that are working towards this for our children. So I appreciate the hard work you guys are doing, and thank you very much for coming in meeting with us. Thank you, and we'll close this public meeting. Thank you. And we have a social development.